Hello everybody and welcome back to my card game tutorial series. In the last video we created a mulligan function and implemented that in our game in order for the player to begin with a legal first hand. So if you haven't seen that video be sure to watch that first. And to all my patrons out there the program files for that video are uploaded to my Patreon and you're able to download those files if you're having issues following along. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below. If you want me to continue this series, hit the like button, and if you haven't already, subscribe. So in this video, we're going to be working with macros. We're going to create a macro, and we're going to use it in our program in order to simplify the variables in our program. And in order to test that out, we're going to be printing out the damage counters for our Pokemon. So damage counters in Pokemon represent 10 hit points for the Pokemon. And each time a Pokemon will do damage to another Pokemon, it will do it in increments of 10. Every time a Pokemon is attacked, those damage counters are removed until that Pokemon is defeated. So let's jump right into that. First, what I do when I work with macros is I create a new object dedicated to macros. And I'll just call that object macros. And in that object, I will create all of my macros in the create event. So the first two macros we're going to create are the card height and the card width. In order to create a macro, you want to type pound macro followed by the variable name. I typically use uppercase numbers for my macros. We're going to call it card width space and we're going to give it a value of 76. And the next one we're going to do is the card height and we're going to give that a value of 106. Macros are essentially global variables. If these have been loaded in the game, I can use this I can use these in any object I want or in any manner I want without initializing them in my create events. So in order for them to be in the game, I want to drop that new object in my room so that when the game loads up the macros are already loaded in the game. So in order to drop it into your game you want to click your instances layer and drag the macro anywhere you want into the room. So now that we've done that we want to go back and implement that in our previous code. So let's say in our object player, in our create event, we want to remove these. But since we've done this already, and we've already implemented a card width and a card height, there's no reason to change all of the old variables to uppercase. So instead of going back and deleting these and then going into my events and changing all of the card width and card height variables, to uppercase, I'm just going to go back to my macros and make them undercase so that it will simplify this process. So now if I go back to all of my objects in their create events, I should be able to remove these variables and the game will still operate as it should. So 
So now if I load my game, let's see if everything still works appropriately. Now I have two errors in my player create event. It looks like I've initialized these variable two times. So let's get rid of that and try again. So with the game loaded, you can see that the cards still go to their proper place. I can still drop a card within its proper boundaries in the field and it still prints in the proper place in the field. So we know that even though we removed all of those initializations and now those variables are, are macros, the game still operates as it should. So to properly test and make sure everything works, I wanted to make sure the mulligan function still worked as well. So now that every aspect of our game has been retested, let's continue to implement these macros into a new object. So now that we've created them, we can just use those macros as regular objects. And that's why in our old lines that use these variables, even though we changed the variable type and the way we initialized it, it still worked. But now let's use these to do something new. And what we're going to do is in our object card, we are going to create a variable for the card's death counters. So we're going to create a new variable called dcounters, and we're going to set that equal to a script command that's called gethp, and we're going to divide it by 10. So what this script is going to do is return the amount of health points this Pokemon has Now this variable is going to return the third position in the nums array that belongs to the card we are using. Similar to how we did it in all of our other videos. So if we go to our arrays, this script will return the third value in our nums array, which will be this one for the given card we're trying to get. So if I click here, we can see that this function turns orange and we know that it has been created properly. The next thing we want to do is make sure that this value is actually being stored in our object. So what we're going to do is create a little test text to make sure that it actually has been taken and we're getting the proper value. So we're going to add a draw text script to our object field card draw event. And in that draw text script, we are going to put the card's x position, the card's y position, and the damage counter variable, but we want it to be a string, so we're going to put it in a string script call. Now what that should do is whenever a card is set to the field, it should print the number of damage counters it has on, in the center of the card. So let's see if that works. So if I drop Poliwag into the field, it returns an error, and that's because I misspelt the variable decounter. It should be decounters. Now let's retry that. So with the game loaded up, 
if I drop Poliwag back onto the field, we see that it draws a 4 in the center of that card. And we can see that Poliwag has 40 hit points, so the number of damage counters that should be printed is 4. If I drop Blastoise, we know he has 100 hit points, so he should have 10 damage counters. So we know that that function is working properly. But now we want to represent these death counters in a similar way to how Pokemon represents these damage counters. And what they do and what they use are little circles. So we're going to create a new script. Instead of uploading one from an image we have, we're just going to create it. And we're going to call it SPR decounter. Now we want this sprite to be 8 pixels by 8 pixels. And we want to edit this image. So we're going to create a white circle here. And then we're going to create a black circle that isn't filled around that filled white circle. And that's going to be our damage counter sprite. So we want that to be in the middle center and we're going to lock it. Now we want to print one of these counters for every damage counter the Pokemon has. So let's go back to our field card object. We no longer want to represent the quantity of these damage counters by a number. So let's remove this line of code. What we want to do is we want to draw one damage counter for each damage counter the card has. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a for loop. For i is equal to 0 and i is less than d counters, i++. Plus plus. And what we want to do is draw the sprite SPR D counter. The sub image will be negative 1 because we want the very first instance of that sprite. And we want to print that out at the card's X position minus the card width. So you see we're using a macro here divided by 2 plus 2 because we want the left side of the first circle to be flush with the left side of the card. And since the card's width is 4 pixels, we want to add it by 2 to push it over to line up perfectly with the side of the card. Then we're going to add 8 pixels for every damage counter that has been drawn. So we're going to multiply it by i. Then we want the y position of this sprite to be at the y position of the card minus the card height divided by 2. And then we're going to subtract 4 pixels to push it just above the height of the card. So if we've done this right, the damage counter should be printed right above the card itself. So let's see if that happens. So if I set Poliwag onto the field, we see we have four damage counters printed above the card. And if you see, that first damage counter is flush with the side of the card. Same with the Polyrath card. It has 90 health points, so it should have 9 damage counters. Now, one thing we have to consider is, say we have a card that has too many health 
Say we have a card that has too many damage counters and it starts to print too far off of the card. For instance, Charizard has the most health points in the first base set. So let's add Charizard to the deck and see how that prints out. Charizard is represented by the card number 4, so if we change 2 to 4 in our deck initialization, it should change all the Blastoise cards to Charizard cards. So let's see if we get lucky in drawing a Charizard card quickly. And we didn't. So let's drop the Charizard card and see how that prints out. So as you can see, it prints out a little bit off of the side of the card. So that's going to be a problem because if we have Charizard on the bench and a card next to it, the health points of Charizard will encroach onto that card. So if I put Squirtle here and Poliwag here, and I'm going to put Charizard in the center of them, you can't see it, but Charizard has two extra damage counters that are above two of Squirtle's damage counters. So we want to fix that so that once it exceeds 10, to begin printing above the damage counters we have. In order to do that, we want to go back to our field card draw event and add two conditions. And the first condition is if i is less than 10, print it out the way we've already printed it out. And if it's not less than 10, we want to create a new draw sprite script call. And it's going to be very similar to the one we've already done. So I'm going to copy and paste that over. And the only difference is we're going to subtract this by 10. so that it starts at the same position but since it's over but since i is greater than 10 we want to reset it and then instead of subtracting by 4 we're going to subtract by 12 so let's load the game and see how that looks a helpful testing tip will be when drawing these cards try to draw as many cards as you can before the mulligan phase begins so you can draw as many cards as you can because that will increase your chances of drawing a Charizard card without having to go through so many mulligan reshuffles. Later in the series we're going to prevent the ability to draw a card when initially drawing your hand but we can exploit this to help us test quicker. So now I'm going to surround Charizard with two other cards and I'm going to put it in the center and as you can see instead of it going off of the Charizard card it's now being printed above the damage counters we've already printed out. Now we can keep going and creating conditions so that it can stack and stack and stack but we know in the base set that Charizard has the most health points so no other card is going to exceed this so we don't need to do any extra if else conditions in this draw event. I hope this was a simple introduction to macros. We'll be using macros extensively when we begin creating the server and the client so that we can do multiplayer and we will be using macros throughout the rest of this project so that we don't have to keep initializing the same variable over and over again. 
in the next video, we're going to allow the user to drop energy cards onto Pokemon on the field. So if you're interested in seeing something like this, hit the subscribe button. If you'd like me to continue this series, hit the like button. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And if you'd like to download these files and get exclusive content, be sure to check out my Patreon. So until next time.